Right. Nope. And nope. Okay. Is this working? Nope. Whatever. It is working. It is working. Uh, well, I'll just shout, I can't be bothered. <laughs> right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Forest Ecology first session, which is just like all the novel methods and new perspectives, which is great because it implies that the second session is um, old methods and outdated perspectives. So you're in the right one, clearly. We've got a fantastic lineup of talks, um, and to represent the new dynamic modern face of forest ecology, we'll be opening with David Poon from the University of Cambridge. Take it away, David. <laughs> Oh, it's loading, okay, here we go. Very slow. Introduce yourself, please. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. It's like LIDAR. <laughs> I think everyone's doing the same thing, right? Right at the same moment. Yeah. Well, that's it, yeah. There we go. Thank you. Is that all we got here? Have we got a zapper? Oh, I'm after the I think they're holding the zapper. Yeah. Which one? Is there a laser? F no, they don't need that. Oh, there is a laser. Okay, here we go. It's dangerous. Um, okay, so there's no, uh, there's probably no illustration anywhere on earth uh, started this uh, this uh, map by David Giroux of um, what's happening on the island of Borneo in South East Asia for rainforests. So in my lifetime, and yes, I am that old, um, <laughs> 1972 today, um, over half the forest has been developed, the dark green are regional forest cover, the light green uh, is heavily logged forest, mostly the lowlands, but also the mountains, and also a massive expansion of oil palm plantations across the landscape. So the work I'm going to talk about today is funded through a NERC program looking at human, human modified uh, tropical forest and how uh, the biogeochemical cycling and biodiversity And it's a part of a wider effort in um, Borneo, particularly in Sabah, where, where we're working. Um, it's not all a gloomy story, but it has been a, a gloomy story for the last 40 years of destruction of forests. But there's real efforts now to protect what's left um, and a commitment from some companies to, to have zero carbon um, uh, and sequestration of neutrality on their lack of their estates. So uh, protecting the remaining forests and letting It's really important thing uh, for that sort of system to work is to have really accurate carbon maps that's really essential to identify whether there is something that's obeying by the rules and whether carbon is actually circulating <coughs> across the, the landscape again. So this is the traditional method for measuring carbon in uh, tropical forests. It's, it's called by uh, climbing up above the buttress so we can measure the diameter of the, the tree uh, reliably. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with this, this method of, of measuring carbon. Everything we do in the airborne laser scanning is reliant on this tree data set. Um, but these provide point measurements, uh, and if you want a map, you have to have some way of interpolating the data that comes from these, uh, from these uh, uh, permanent blocks and other tree images. So laser scanning, for those of you unfamiliar with it, is a technology um, that's about 20 years old now, even a bit older than that, whereby you can have an aircraft flying over a landscape Every second it's firing off a couple of hundred thousand laser pulses as it's yeah. hitting the, the surface of the ground, returning to the aircraft, and it's measuring the time that takes. And by having a really accurate GPS and a system that's measuring the, the angle of the plane, uh, it can feed that into a computer and work out exactly where uh, on the ground it bounced off, what, 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 where in the surface it bounced off. So this gives you a, a really exquisite three-dimensional view of this is flying over a little bit of, uh, of Saba, where the NERC plane went in 2014. Uh, and here's just a typical view of a tree which you get from a laser scanner. Here's where all the little laser pulses bounced off. And I was briefly, briefly famous, <laughs> my, my postdoctoral glasses, uh, <laughs> because I found the tallest tree ever recorded in the tropics uh, in March. I got into the top tree in that uh, tropical season. And then my friend and arch rival in, uh, in, in uh, uh, in America, 
Africa, um, great, great Africa that's flying this year, and actually found 50 taller ones in Ghana, so I, I'm no longer famous. Um, but this is just an illustration of what you can get from the ocean there. And so the traditional approach, um, which actually Greg Asmus really pioneered uh, for, lay, for, for measuring carbon from laser scans, quite a, a straightforward approach is to take the top of the canopy from that point cloud which you get from the LIDAR, just take an average of that for your plot, so you've got the carbon difference, and then you just correlate the two. That's what we've got here. Top of canopy height and above ground carbon stock measured in the field. And here's, well, I'll explain what these points are in a minute. Um, and so this is not taking a lot of that sophisticated data set. It's really taking a very simple summary statistic, a mean of canopy height, top height. And this is Greg Asmus' work from 14 sites around the world. And you can see it works reasonably well. We've got top of canopy height from the LIDAR uh, and field estimates of carbon here. And we're getting these power law relationships with different parts of the world. One thing to, or the topic, one thing to spot here is that these lines aren't the same. In different parts of the world, they vary. And that's sort of what you might expect because wood density is changing, the density of the ocean the forest is changing as you go around different parts of the world. But you're getting these uh, power law relationships. You might imagine that other information would, from the laser, laser scanning would be important. And one thing you can do is, this is looking down on the laser scan, so I think we've got a tall tree and a short, this is a shorter area, the yellow, which is the top of the leaf tree. Just taking a slice through that at 10 meters height or 20 meters height and spotting where the gaps are in the canopy, you might imagine that gives you some more valuable information about forest biomass. If you've got more gappiness, then you have lower biomass. So I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. The alternative approach, which is the first title of this talk, <laughs> is to do what we call a tree-centric approach, where you actually take a lot more information out, out of that point cloud. You start detecting individual trees, uh, and then you measure their crown diameter and height from the air, and then you're doing sort of the same thing you're doing from the ground now. You're instead of measuring the diameter and maybe the height <coughs> and getting your mass from that, you're taking it from the, the crown bits and the height and doing the same thing. So each, each tree, you're then calculating its carbon, and you just add up all the trees which you can see in the laser scan. So it's, um, this is much more akin to what you're doing on the ground. This is a, taking a, a summary statistic approach. Okay. Oh, it's louder than it is. <laughs> I can whisper over here. So our, view, our, our method, thanks to Tommaso for this lovely slide, th this is a traditional approach to... Uh, to uh, this is a traditional approach to, uh, to measuring trees, looking up at some enormous giant uh, from the forest floor. And the, and the laser scanning approach is we're, we're going to try and spot these individual trees from, from the aircraft and do it that way. It's very much akin. So we're working in Sabah. That's up in the northeast of, of Borneo. I'd say the Sabah's here, part of Malaysia. And uh, the NERP flight in 2014 covered these areas here, which will be and everybody who's worked in uh, Sabah will recognize those sites. The big SAFE experiment run by Rob Ewell, Bannon Valley, home of Prince William Grizzly, Sepalot, Maliao. These are the famous sites in, in, uh, in Sabah for tropical research. And what we've got here is top of canopy height as measured from our LIDAR survey uh, and carbon measurements from all these plots. And look, I thank everybody involved. And you might not know you're involved at this point. No, hopefully everybody does know they're involved <laughs> <laughs> in providing this spot data for us. And these are one hectare plots here, and these tiny ones are much smaller than that. And what we see here is actually the relationship between top of canopy height and carbon in the uh, forest in Sabah is actually fairly noisy. I mean, there, there is one there, isn't there? But it is quite noisy, just to use the top of canopy height, as Greg Asma has done previously. And that presumably means that um, there's just lots of different forest types in this, in this area. So it's a bit like sticking together all the, all the different sites that Greg Asma has done from various parts of the world. And that actually underneath here is his spot data. These are very small spots, uh, but this scatter here is his spot data. Uh, so you can see Sabah's expanding and filling a lot of that uh, area seen in, the, in, in his, uh, his previous study. So what we find, and I'm not going to go into the details of the modeling, um, but what we find is if you just use top of canopy height, like uh, has been done previously, this is the relationship you get between what you can measure with the LIDAR and the field. And so it's, well, it's quite a 
chunky triangular relationship. Uh, but if you start to put this canopy openness measurement in as well, so you're just putting a slice through the forest and measuring how many gaps there are, then you can narrow that uh, relationship down. And these things were the root mean square error of the sort of thing here. 36 is the uh, is, uh, root mean square error of those estimates. OK, what am I going to talk about next? Oh, here's a map of, <laughs> of, of SAFE, just for those who are interested in seeing the map of the SAFE project. This is just pop up the press. Uh, and anybody working at SAFE, this will be, be available very shortly if you want to use it for anything you're doing, comparing it with animal surveys and that sort of thing. Using that. So it's, it's, a, it's a much better, actually, than, than the satellite imagery. And that's why you pay all your money for laser scanning if you go to space. Uh, this is uh, two previous papers showing how good the space surveying is and root mean square error is much, much uh, less for so-called estimates of carbon. Okay, tree centric. How long have I got? <laughs> got three minutes. Three minutes. Did you kill me? My slide machine. I don't know where it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's Cephalot uh, Reserve um, up in the northeast of the country. This is the entirety of the reserve. Um, and I just thought I'd zoom in on, on so it's about what, seven by two, three kilometers, something like that and it's all been laser scanned. We can zoom in and we can start seeing the individual trees. And what we've done is we've now driven to segment those trees and recognize the individual trees in this image. So you can actually see alluvial forest here and we're going up onto, onto a hillside with sandstone forest with a different um, height. And here's just another one of some oil palms growing alongside the forest. And here's just another one of uh, some alluvial forest where the tallest trees are found. The, the whitest of really tall trees. And so we've Yes, we've identified each of those trees. And then Tommaso, who's giving the next talk, well worth staying for. Um, well, um, and I should also say the next talk after that is also really worth going to because they terrestrial laser scan uh, really got beautiful images of the trees from the ground, which is another way of refining what we're doing. Uh, two plugs in one. Um, this, uh, this is a, a bit of work which Tommaso Huca did where he, he got in contact with everybody he could find who uh, got biomass measured on the ground for the trees and measured their dimensions, so the, the crown widths and the heights of the trees and the biomass from around the world. And so he's come up with an allometric formula uh, similar to the sort of thing you'll be familiar with with Jerome Picard's uh, work on ground-based inventories, which just allows you to do it from, from the air. So to, s to summarize all that, what happens when we, what we did, I should explain what I did first, so we, we one minute, is that one minute for 15 minutes, or is that one for 14 minutes? Yeah, 14 minutes. Oh. <laughs> so what we've got here is um, we've, we've estimated from those height and crown widths for all those trees, uh, the diameters of, tr of the trees, and the biomasses of those trees using laserometry. And this is just showing you how well we've done at, uh, at um, emulating what we see in, the, in forest plots. So there's 36 forest plots we looked at. Tomaso's talk will go into those in more detail. So these are how many trees are in each of these size classes in that forest. And this is the real data, and the tier ones are the LIDAR data. And what you see is we actually did a good job of detecting this as potential to detect it, except for the really small trees, which we can't detect through our li LIDAR. It's too deep into the canopy. Um, and the biomass, it's more scattering, but we're not detecting the small tree biomasses at all. And this is our results, really tall, complicated forest in Saba. It's doing about as well as the previous technique. We'd love it to do better, but it comes out about the same. Uh, but I don't think that's the real value, at ultimately, of this, this sort of data, because it's not just about <coughs> measuring carbon. What we really want to do is be able to track trees like this over time. So we come back after five years, after 10 years, repeat LIDAR survey, and just see how these individual tall trees are doing. And by doing that, we can do something which permanent plots can't do, and that's just monitor really big trees across the tropics, which are going to be very, very important in the context of climate change and, and anthropogenic change in general. Thanks to NERC. Uh, thanks for those people who provided <coughs> data. And uh, any questions? Thank you, David. Questions? Um, I was wondering, um, how would algorithms um, uh, measure each individual tree, and are you trying to 
trying to also, um, by what I understood, to analyze how the, the, the limits of the crowd is, yeah. is free, free to decide, right? Yeah, well, at the moment, we're just doing one off, one, one image at a time. We haven't done the time series yet. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, mm -hmm. there's lots of different algorithms which are available, actually, which we've developed to ourselves. Uh, uh, one very simple is just based on looking at the tops of the crowd of the, of the model in raster format, or the other one uses the whole point cloud block as well. So you've got 16 bits of it. So it's very similar to having, as you did, lots of different algorithms that can be used for that. So you can show it, it has like a line going from the, from the, from the side? Thank you all for coming. You may have guessed that the two talks are, are related. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about how topography shapes variation in forest structure, um, function, and composition. Um, uh, so we were going to the same part of the world, but I just wanted to sort of jump in with a, with a question, which is, so what do you think shapes the structure and function and <laughs> composition of, uh, of forests? Um, and so if you're anything like me, this is, this is the first image that conjures up to, uh, to my mind, which is some large scale gradient where we're thinking about macro scale variation across driven by climate. Um, and this is shaping how, how trees are sort of uh, uh, are responding to, to, to climate, how they're photosynthesizing, which species live where, and that in turn drives uh, patterns of forest structure and, uh, and, uh, and function. Um, you know, this is certainly true. Uh, but we also know uh, from, from a lot of work which has been done for, for, for decades that tropical forests and all forests really can vary quite dramatically in their sort of structure and composition across really quite uh, fine spatial scales. So you can walk through a forest and within a couple of uh, hundred meters go from a very, very tall forest to a much, much shorter one with fewer or more trees. Um, and we also know that that uh, variation is largely driven by uh, differences in sort of uh, microclimate or differences in soil nutrients uh, or, uh, or different uh, aspects which can in some way be related to the topography of, the, of, of that landscape. Um, and so we know that so topography is sort of uh, is able to control fine scale variation in species composition which in turn interacts with determining forest structure and as we saw in the last talk that ultimately is very important for understanding variation in, in carbon <coughs> stocks, and this is something a lot of us are interested in doing. So we've got a sort of really good tradition in using uh, permanent field uh, data to address some of these questions, sort of uh, trying to quantify carbon in, 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 in plots, some of them quite large, uh, qu uh, identify species when we have the capability of doing so, um, but we're always limited in the, at the spatial scales that we can operate unless we have really access to, to huge amounts of money. Um, and this is where the theme of sort of remote sensing comes into the talk and the, the idea that we can use some of these other technologies in combination with, not in replacement of, um, to access some of these other uh, points on this, uh, on this sort of uh, hypothetical drawing. So you heard a little bit about what LIDAR, uh, LIDAR is, but briefly if anyone just came in at the end of the, of the talk, it's sort of a, a laser-based technology which is really good at measuring sort of distances between objects. So it's it can allow us to calculate and sort of re reconstruct forest structure. It can also see below the trees, so actually tell us something about the topography of the landscape. Um, and then there's this other uh, aspect, hyperspectral imagery, which is often collected uh, together with, uh, with LIDAR, depending, for instance, NER NERC flights tend to collect the two uh, hand in hand. And what this is doing is essentially measuring how light is reflected off of an, or an object uh, in many, many, many different slices, many more than we can see with our eye, and sort of extending beyond the sort of visible range. And the idea is that these 
properties of objects, their chemical structure and composition affect the way light is reflected, and so we can infer, and infer something about uh, what, uh, what chemicals are there and how, how they differ and what species might be in a, in, a, in a given forest. So you've seen this before. This is where we're, uh, where we're working at the moment. Uh, so we're in Sabah in, in uh, northeastern uh, Borneo. We're going to be focusing on the cephalox site uh, for, for the moment. Uh, and I'll, uh, I think it'll be quite obvious when you see this why. It's sort of a perfect place to test some of these ideas. So within a relatively small landscape of, uh, of relatively well-preserved forest, we have really strong variation in topography. So this is the digital elevation model from the LIDAR showing you these north to south uh, ridges. Uh, and then we've got uh, alluvial plains. And on the side, the sort of uh, higher elevation sort of uh, out outcrop. Um, and what we find in Sepilok is this gives rise to three very distinct forest types. So we have sandstone forest on <coughs> the left on those ridges. Uh, we have alluvial <coughs> forests in the lowlands, which are dominated by dipter carp, some of them exceeding 70 meters or plus in height. And then on the heath forest, these are sort of very nutrient poor soils, uh, and the forest is, is very stunted and uh, very starkly different to, to what you get just a couple of hundred meters down the, down the slope. So if we what we see here is those, those plots that you see, those are actually the location of our permanent sampling plots. And when I mean say ours, I have nothing to do with them. Uh, uh, this is a, um, an um, absolutely amazing data set that's been collected over more than a decade uh, with these nine four hectare plots that have been sampled through time. And so we've got really nice data from there. Um, so if we zoom into those, this is what the <coughs> canopy now looks like from the LIDAR. So this is the alluvial forest on the left. So the, uh, as I said, there's these really tall emergent dipter carps, but actually quite a lot of gaps in there, as you can see. So you can see almost all the way down to the ground. So this really funny kind of uh, uh, tall but gappy forest. Uh, the sandstone forest is, is almost as equally impressively tall. Uh, so it's some trees are still exceeding seven to 60 meters in height, and it's much, much denser. Um, and that was reflected, if you were here at the last talk, in the, in the carbon content of this forest. And funny, the heath forest, uh, all the way to the right, which is noticeably <coughs> shorter. So, so we've got real variation in forest structure, uh, but we also have real variation in species composition. So this is on the left, uh, sort of a Venn diagram showing you different possible combinations. I won't run through all of them, but you can see that the alluvial forests in general are much, much richer in species. Uh, uh, they tend to share quite a few of them with sandstone, which is an intermediate richness, and then heath forest, again, shares quite a few with sandstone, sort of a stepping <coughs> stone almost but it's poorer in species. And the variation is not just in species numbers, but also in their traits. So this is just an example here, looking at the weighted mean wood density of those, of those plots. So the alluvial forests have quite a high variability, but generally lower wood density. Uh, sandstone is slightly higher, and the heath forest is, is quite noticeably uh, higher than that. So this is, this is what we have, and this is what I want to test. Uh, this, I, this is where I want to see whether we can use these combination of these really nice field data with, uh, with these new technologies to test a model something like this. So on the left, we have properties of, of species composition, diversity, or traits. Uh, and these are in, in the model are, sort of are driven by a, a set of, uh, of sort of topographic variables. So they might be elevation, slope, TPIs, topographic position index. And then we have forest structural attributes like gap fraction, top canopy height. Uh, which we've seen in the previous talk are sort of related to carbon, and this is what we're trying to, to get at. To test this, we have a, a, a problem. So we can upscale the LIDAR very easily. We can measure these properties across any landscape that we, that we have. Not so much for the, for the spectral information where we have to sort of first estimate the diversity uh, and composition of the forest. So this is, I'll zoom through this quite quickly, but wh what we're doing essentially, this is a snapshot of the spectral data. If you take one of these plots, what we're trying to measure is within each plot, we're making the assumption that the variability in all these spectral signatures is going to reflect how many species are in there. So if you have high variability within all these different spectra, then you have more species. If you have a monoculture, you'd have one single reflectance profile. Whereas the wood density is being modeled as a, as a mean uh, reflectance of that plot. Uh, and we're using random forests uh, to, to do this. There's different ways of, uh, of doing this, but this is what we've done so far. And this is looking at the importance of all of these bands that we've measured uh, from the spectral data in, pr in terms of predicting species richness. So we can say that there's quite important bands in the visible and also in the short wave infrared and the near infrared. And when we scale that up and we take the top five 
bands from that model and try to estimate species richness uh, from our plots. This is the kind of relationship that we're getting. Uh, again, just not laboring this too much. This is the same for the wood density. Uh, and this is the kind of relationship that we're getting for the plots. So we're, we seem to be uh, quite happy uh, um, with this. And so from this, we can sort of, as I said, upscale to the, to the landscape and actually <coughs> test this model. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show all of these relationships. This is being tested with a structural equation model. But I'll show you a few of the more interesting patterns that we're finding. Um, so this is how elevation affects these different components. So we get, we're picking up this really strong negative uh, relationship between uh, elevation and wood density. So wood density is increasing uh, as you go up the, up the slopes. Numbers of species are decreasing, uh, as are both the gap fraction and the top canopy height. So this is, this is again, uh, independent of the plot data, but it's picking up all the same patterns that we were seeing in the plot data. It's not completely independent of the plot data. It's based on it. But um, this is just showing you visually what these relationships look like. So this is top of canopy height as a function of elevation. So you can see that there's quite a lot of scatter, but there really seems to be a strong upper constraint to that relationship. Uh, so as you, as you go up the elevational gradient, so you can't be taller than a given amount as you, after some point. And again, the gap fraction seems to be uh, uh, decreasing in, along some nonlinear function of, uh, of elevation. So essentially, forests at higher elevation in the Karangas and these heath forests uh, tend to be uh, low, but also have low gaps, so they're actually quite dense. This is, again, this is for, for slope. So it's, it's interesting, actually, that once you account for the effect of elevation, you're picking up, uh, in some cases, slightly counterintuitive effects of, of the terrain slope. So species richness seems to be increasing on, on higher slopes um, with, the, with the gap fraction decreasing. Um, but I wanted to just show quickly that we're, we're not just looking at, at that component of the model, but we're also looking at the interaction between the, the, the composition and the structure. And so one interesting thing that's coming out is that gap fraction seems to be strongly related to number of species. Um, so you might expect that from just a, from an ecological standpoint uh, where you have more gaps, you have uh, so pioneer species or new species recruiting in there. It could also be an artifact of the data. Essentially, if we have gaps, we're seeing underneath. So we have access to a, a, a wider uh, spectra of, uh, of, uh, of trees. And we're picking up some patterns are very weak in this case, but some expected patterns uh, that we see in the plot data. So the wood density uh, seems to uh, negatively uh, affect top canopy height in the sense that uh, more densely wooded, uh, as you would expect, more densely wooded uh, species tend to be slightly shorter, um, uh, gap, again, with a gap fraction. OK, so that, that's just the, the flavor of the kind of things we can do. I just wanted to end sort of on a similar point that uh, David had made before. So this, to me, this is extremely interesting from an ecological perspective, the kind of things that we can do. But it's also got some, I think, very important applications from a more practical side of uh, things as well. So this is what a lot of Saba uh, looks like, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, and so having access to products such as these, so a, a carbon map for, for this area, and possibly estimates of how many species are there can really help us uh, better uh, design systems where we're deciding where are we going to go in and, uh, and uh, put in new oil, oil palm plantations and where should we instead really be careful about doing that and make sure that we sort of uh, preserve some of this land. And with that, I just wanted to thank very, very many people who have contributed data from all sides, NERC ARAF, uh, who sort of provided the, the, the airborne data and the Bali and Safe project. Thank you. They're clustered. Yeah, they're, they're, they're clustered to, to, to minimize the signal to noise ratio uh, to, to some degree, but not too much. There's still, I mean, there's still a huge amount of data going in there. Um, and I mean, I'm slightly scared. The reason why we did this approach where we're taking, selecting the top five bands instead of using all of them is that I'm very conscious of overfitting the model. So essentially, we're, we've got 34 plots and we're, we're feeding it 190 bands, and it's obviously going to be a perfect prediction. Uh, so we're, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's spatial mm -hmm. sort of the height perspective of the system. Yeah. That's a that's yeah.
So, I mean, ideally, the, this would be a more mechanistic approach where we're trying to identify why are those bounds good predictors of these properties as opposed to just going on the statistical uh, relation to it. But yeah, that would be really interesting to look at that. The, the, the truth, um, uh, the, I, I did this in, in about one day, um, <laughs> the, the hyperspectral stuff. So I, 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 I mean, this is like sort of work in progress. Uh, but yes, the, I mean, I'm, es I'm essentially following the standard approach that most people tend to use, but I'm not in any way saying, no, no, no I I'm talking about, and when I say standard approach, this is the, the approach that Greg Asner has, has sort of pioneered and I mean, it's, it's obviously successful and, uh, and it's, it's, it's viable, but um, yeah, I agree with you that we could do this more mechanistically and that would be much more valuable. Okay, thank you very much, Nasser. So I'll try to take further questions. Right, so the next guest we have, Tim Calder, Chosen by the National Physical Laboratory and UCL in London, and is a postdoc with Matt Dignan, and he'll be talking about ground-based LIDAR from an interesting perspective. Yeah, we're having a good this person's really slow. Um, I need to get the Zoom chat question here. Okay. It's just, yeah, sorry, it's just not loading at all now. So which one? The call so video and the video call video. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yeah. How much of your talk introduction can you do without the slides while someone runs for uh, IT support? Yeah. Can you improvise? A little bit. So I'll be talking about terrestrial LIDAR. So I'll be taking the laser system that's been used on the aircraft. I will take it down to a ground-based ground -based platform. So unlike airborne LIDAR, it's not going to be like a wall-to-wall -wall technique. It's going to be more like biomass measurement at the plot level. Um, I'm going to show you some nice maps now. So, uh, Most of the joy in terrestrial laser scanning is to see in the, the pictures. <laughs> your questions uh, so, we can, so we can get to given these problems can I suggest to later speakers in the session if you have got your talk on a pen drive that would be great 
if you haven't been really like follow up and drive off mate I'm happy to help. Yeah. Magic, thank you very much. These were the maps I was going to show you. Uh, so there's been a few pen tropical biomass maps uh, produced the last couple of years, and two of the most famous ones is on top is the Sarkozy map, and then you have the Bakini map there. So essentially, they use the same input remote sensing data, a um, little bit of different field data and different processing techniques, but they both produce like a pan tropical biomass map. And then Ed Mitchell published in 2013 a comparison between these two maps. So you have the absolute difference here and you have the relative difference here. And you can see the absolute difference between those two maps can be up to 150 <coughs> points per plot, actually. Um, so there's real kind of need to actually get better plot-based measurements. So not wall-to-wall, -wall, like I said, we just do plot-based measurements. Um, so there's essentially three ways that you can get to a plot-based measurement of biomass at a tree level. So the first one is obviously you can cut down the tree. You can weigh the tree. It's uh, obviously not sustainable because the tree is gone. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. So traditionally what we're doing is we develop these kind of allometric equations. So they've been based on data sets uh, of destructive harvest of trees, a few thousands all over the tropics, and then also measurements of deviation height. So you can extrapolate your biomass based on DVH or DVH and height measurements. So that's what traditionally been done. People go to the field, they take these measurements and they upscale uh, to extrapolate biomass. So what we're suggesting is to use terrestrial LIDAR. So this is a, uh, one of the instruments that's commercially available at the one that we're using to essentially create a virtual forest. So we can virtually harvest our trees and then measure the volume and then extrapolate biomass from that. Um, so I'm gonna give a kind of a proof of concept. So this is work we've been doing in Australia uh, about three years ago, and since then we've been also collecting data in the tropics, which I'm not gonna show. Uh, so this is just a case study for Australia. Uh, the reason why it was quite a good um, study site in Australia is because we could do the harvesting, which was quite essential to validate our model, actually. So we collected inventory data and also uh, pre and post harvesting terrestrial LIDAR data. So I'm looking at two research questions. One is like, how good are these traditional measurements if you use allometric equations? How good are your measurements actually when you compare them to the reference data? And also, how good is our new approach that we suggest using terrestrial LIDAR measurements? So our plots are located in Victoria and Australia. Um, so very simple setup here, just one in the center, one center scan, and then uh, one scan northeast, south, and west. So five in total. Uh, in the tropics, you would use a much denser sampling design because uh, there's obviously a lot of occlusion. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the details, but all the details are in this NEE paper. Um, the destructive data was collected by, uh, by foresters specialized in, in cutting down trees and weighing them, so it's like really good equipment on site. We've been collecting the destructive measurements in three different categories, like everything above 10 centimeters, uh, between five and 10 centimeters, and then everything smaller than five centimeters. And then we also selected disks that went that were sent back to the lab so we could dry them, get the fresh rate to dry rate conversion factor, as well as the, as the uh, wood density information for these sites. Work. So this is the uh, terrestrial LiDAR data. So it's, a, uh, it's like a fly through coming from above, but these data are actually collected at the ground. So these are the five different scans put together. So to collect these data, so this is an 80 meter radius plot, uh, diameter plot, it took about one and a half, two hours for two people in that kind of environment. But the number of people you need in the tropic is not more, it's, but it will obviously increase time significantly. Um, you saw some trees disappear, so that's when we switched from the pre-scan to the post-scan, so these trees have been harvested. And that's kind of the quality data that, that, that you, that you're kind of working with. Uh, so you have a full representation of the 3D structure of the tree. So if we look at the results, so first I just wanna show the results of the allometric equations that we use. So we use two different allometric equations. So um, they're all eucalyptus species. We have three different species in our plot. So on the left, you can see the species specific allometric equations, also allometric equations developed for Australia. Um, and then on the right, you have the generic eucalyptus equation where we just put all the trees. So the 65 destructive harvested trees in our data set. And you see it works quite well up to half a ton. And then you can see in both um, 
on the metric equation that you actually see an underestimation of the biomass using these equations. We've been seeing similar stuff in the tropics, although obviously the biomass here, the highest one is three and a half tons, which is relative, relatively small compared to tropical biomass, but we've been seeing similar stuff in the tropics as well. So how do we then calculate biomass from terrestrial LIDAR? Um, so you've seen the, the fly through animation, so it's a big point cloud. So the first step we do is we calculate biomass as a single tree level, so we need to extract those single trees, which sounds a lot more simple than it actually is. That's where a lot of the, uh, the algorithm development came in. Uh, so once we have a single tree, we reconstruct the tree, we can calculate the volume, and then using the wood density information that we've collected in the field, we convert it to biomass, and we compare it also with the destructive measurement. Um, so this is the, an example of a single point cloud that then converted to like a cylinder model because if you just have points, you can't calculate anything. You need to make something quantitative. Okay. Um, we made a little animation about the whole methodology, very simple, one minute uh, to explain it in a very clear way. So we go to the field with our laser instrument. So we scan from one location because the laser beam cannot penetrate any hard material, so it cannot penetrate stems or branches. So that's why we have different scan locations to actually get like, to reduce occlusion and build up uh, a nice 3D point cloud of the forest. Uh, it seems a bit simplified with just a single tree, but it would be the same. So it's millions of points on one tree. And then we need to convert it from these points to a quantitative model. So we've been using um, cylinders, very small cylinders to build the tree. So we always start at the bottom of the tree and then we use some kind of least squares optimization to fit the right shape and then we keep building, keep building. Um, we've been testing different geometric shapes, but we found that the cylinder was the most optimal one and the most efficient one as well. So this step, once this is finished and you have the most optimal uh, parameters for your cylinder, you just keep building. You first keep building uh, your stem and then you branch out and you do all the branches as well. So you have a full quantitative model of your tree. So we just use it for biomass now, but there's obviously a lot more applications that you can do with it, because you will have branching order, branching angles, so there's all these potential ecological other applications that this kind of data can be used for. Now if you look at the results for the biomass, so these are the 65 trees with the reference trees, so the harvesting data on the x-axis, and then the, the CLS reconstructions, and the estimates of biomass based on that on the y-axis. And you can see there's some error bars on here. So this is the prediction interval of the modeling. So we do the modeling about 10 times because every time you build the model, it starts a slightly different location in the tree. So we want to kind of capture that prediction variability as well. And you see that there's hardly any bias. It agrees, this, so this, this dash line is the one-to-one -one line, um, especially if you compare it here with one of the elementary equations where you can clearly see uh, that it's hard to underestimate for the larger trees. It's not what we're seeing when we use this direct approach using terrestrial LIDAR measurement. Um, if we look at plot level, on these sites, we saw that allometry underestimated the biomass with about 30 to 36 percent. With uh, LIDAR, we had a 10 percent error. It was an overestimation. Part of the reason is that because this was fairly early work and um, we, we couldn't remove the leaves very well. And obviously, if you start fitting small cylinders through leaves, you kind of create a small overestimation. So we now have an extra step where we actually remove those leaves as well. So we're just working with a woody structure. So I would even think there's a few percent that we will uh, get rid of, of the overestimation. And I guess this might be one of the most interesting figures is that, so you have the, the two um, allometric equations here, and this is the LIDAR one, uh, DBH, so actually tree size on the x-axis, and then the absolute error in biomass uh, for a single tree. And you see an exponential increase for both allometric equations with increasing tree size, whereas the absolute error actually is quite constant for, um, for the LIDAR measurement. So relatively, uh, your, your, uh, so your relative error would actually decrease for larger trees. And it's quite an important finding because most of the biomass is in the larger trees. There will be a few large trees which will have most of the biomass in the plot. So it's quite important, uh, this figure. Two remarks to finish. What is DBH? I think I'm just stepping back, what is DBH? Uh, it is shown this picture where you were measuring this diameter above the buttress. It's, it's like labor intensive. It's, it's not always straightforward. Um, 
So this is an example of a tree. I think this one is a Gabon. And what we can do, what we also have implemented in the model, we can also create a mesh if we have buttress trees. We can just step away from just these cylindrical cylinder fitting and we can just fit a mesh to the buttress root so we can actually calculate the clean volume uh, for that section. Uh, very important, we are not measuring biomass, we're measuring volume. Also, allometric equations essentially is the approximate of uh, the volume and then use wood density to convert it to biomass. And just this is an example in white and woods, and it's quite striking when I saw the tree, it looks perfectly healthy from a distance, and then you come closer and it's completely hollow inside. So if you would calculate a volume for this and use some kind of wood density value from a database or a plot average, you might end up with a, a quite biased biomass measurement. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So sorry for the uh, technical problems. We have time for one quick question while we change slides. From the back, yeah. We have a few savanna sites, yeah. um, but we're really then we're just focusing on the trees in the savanna. So it's uh, the grass, and we we scan from uh, wheat fields as well, and it's just it's hard to evolve that because there's the technical limitations of the instrument as well. So actually, everything smaller than seven millimeters that the beam actually diameter of the instrument, our instrument, we cannot resolve. So for these very small grassy types, it, it just will not really work. Oh, something came up. So, okay, our next speaker is Peter Martin Mohamed Yo from um, from the European State University of Edinburgh. Talking about the modernisation of the Edinburgh. Uh, hi, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Siti. Um, uh, today, uh, I would like to present uh, my work in below ground production of mangrove forest at Kelantan Delta, which is situated on the east coast of Malaysian Peninsula. My work is slightly different from previous uh, presentation because uh, I'm working with the worm in the soil rather than the above ground. <laughs> As for introductions, uh, mangrove can be found between estuaries and the seas. Uh, due, due to their habitat uh, in the estuaries and the seas, they're receiving a substantial amount of organic matter uh, from this uh, ecosystem during uh, tidal and river exchange. This organic matter uh, may be uh, deposited in the sediment or remain suspended in the water column. The, uh, the retention of organic matter in the water column uh, induce <coughs> a, a substantial amount of the nutrient and thus promoting high uh, primary production in the water column. Mangrove forest productivity studies has uh, mostly focused on above ground production, uh, such as uh, little fall and stem uh, diameter studies. Little fall uh, can provide an idea of uh, available of organic matter uh, ready to be exported to the seas, and stem diameter studies uh, will give uh, an idea about biomass accumulation in the, uh, in the tree trunk. If you, uh, <coughs> sorry, this is a kind of a picture kind of little fall and the traditional uh, approach for the above ground measurement. In recent years. Um, Below ground uh, production has received uh, much uh, attention because uh, they have important role in global uh, climate change uh, mitigation. Mangrove can allocate 30 to 60 percent of their below ground, sorry, uh, allocate their biomass to the below ground, uh, which is a nutrient uh, limited mechanism to capture the most uh, limiting resources in the mangrove soil. Um, biomass accumulation has a functional role in the uh, um, below ground process, such as uh, soil formation. This is because um, the organic matter, such as uh, roots, uh, benthic mats, and turf algae, are responsible to adding this organic matter and thus raise the soil uh, <coughs> elevation, uh, elevation gain. 
Another uh, important uh, wheel ground process uh, uh, is uh, for the carbon cycling, uh, which is uh, a valuable carbon sink. And now a number of uh, factors that controlling uh, this process, such as nutrient status, soil temperature, salinity, oxygen concentration, and landfall. This study uh, is present the first research into below ground production on the Malaysian Peninsula. Therefore, the aim of the study is to determine below ground mangrove productivity in the Kelantan Delta. Uh, this is a study site uh, of, my, uh, of my work. Uh, this is Kelantan Delta, which is situated in the east coast of Malaysian Peninsula. And this is figure shows the uh, plots uh, in the study area, which is uh, here, directing, uh, facing directly to the South China Sea. Uh, we conduct uh, 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 this root growth experiment using uh, in-growth core. If you can see here, this is the figure for the in-growth core. Um, uh, and uh, there are uh, five uh, sampling plots uh, of size 10 meters length and 10 meters uh, width, randomly uh, set up uh, with, uh, within mangrove forest. For the root sampling, um, there are 20 in-growth core of, um, of this size randomly placed in each plot which is bringing 100 cores in total. Uh, and the uh, core collection, there are three cores collected per plot at each uh, three-month interval from December 2014 and until February 2016. To see uh, the, uh, how much the root biomass in the forest, uh, I collected um, uh, 15 cores, sorry, 15 undisturbed cores collected in February, which is uh, three cores per plot. So this figure shows how uh, the in-growth core set up. Uh, I use uh, the 50 centimeters uh, height of this uh, core. And um, after that, uh, dig a hole and bringing out all the uh, soils uh, in the 50 centimeters depth. And then uh, I have a uh, 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 cut into uh, I cut the the roots into the small pieces and uh, bring back into the to the holes, which is can uh, uh, support for the provide nutrients for the root growth. Uh, and then this figure shows how I um, re uh, putting the soil uh, back in in the ingrowth core. For the root extraction, each core uh, was divided into five soil layers, and each layer consists of 10 centimeters. And the roots uh, were washed with water until they were free of all soil. And finally, the roots were soaked in the water, and floating roots ha uh, were hand-picked. The living roots were sorted into fine roots and the coarse roots. And the size of fine roots is less than three millimeters, and cost root is uh, more than three millimeters. At final stage, uh, all roots were oven dried at uh, 80 degrees until constant weight. Uh, I also, um, um, sorry, uh, there are few, uh, very few uh, dead roots uh, were found in this study. Therefore, uh, this dead root is not included in the analysis. I also measure the abiotic factors. Uh, to determine what are the control for the root production, uh, which is uh, dissolved oxygen, salinity, soil temperature, and the soil nutrient. I collect the soil, uh, for the soil nutrient analysis, I collect the soil uh, using PVC tubes and bring back to the laboratory for further analysis. I also uh, doing um, uh, above ground uh, monitoring so uh, in each plot, all trees uh, were installed with dendrometer band, and uh, stem growth was recorded every three months um, from December to, uh, 2014 until February 2016. Uh, there are uh, another above ground parameters uh, that I have measured, uh, which is uh, canopy openness and uh, chlorophyll content. 
for the statistical analysis, I using I use uh, one-way ANOVA to find differences between dates of collection, plots, and soil depth, and <coughs> post hoc turkey tests were performed to find significant differences. And uh, Pearson correlation was performed to find association between root biomass, above ground growth, and environmental variable. This uh, table shows the uh, result, the mangrove forest structure in the uh, Avicenna uh, albastan in Kelantan Delta. Um, the average, uh, the average uh, diameter for the trees in all plots is 17.58. And uh, I also measure the initial tree height of 14, uh, point, uh, 14 meters. And I use uh, elementary allocation, which is uh, developed for mangrove forests to calculate the above ground production. And uh, there are about almost five uh, tonnes per hectare per year uh, the above ground production was recorded. And this is result for the standing root biomass, uh, which is accounted for uh, 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 almost 21 tonnes per hectare. This table shows the environmental data that uh, I have recorded in February 2016. And all this data are not significantly um, different among plot. This is figure shows uh, below ground production. As you can see here, on the X axis is the month of collection. On the Y axis is the uh, value of the root dry weight in uh, gram per meter square. Uh, the yellow one is the fine root and blue one is the coarse root. Uh, in the forest, the standing root biomass uh, was accounted for uh, 2,081 2 gram per meter square, or I have calculated, I have converted to the uh, ton per hectare, which is 20, uh, almost 21 ton per hectare. And if you can see here, the most contribution of the roots uh, is from fine roots rather than the coarse root. For below ground product, the total for below ground production, um, uh, this graph show, uh, show clearly seasonal trend of the root biomass, which is peaked during uh, March uh, 2015 and February, uh, sorry, uh, December 2015. Uh, this is happened di uh, after uh, after monsoon season and during monsoon season. Within one year, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the roots uh, has uh, sorry. Uh, we can see the root uh, rapid root turnover within one year of the experiment. If you can see here, there is. Uh, no cost root observed uh, uh, after a year of root growth experiment. The first, uh, the first uh, from my data, the first, uh, the fastest estimate for the below ground production is about uh, uh, 66 tons per hectare per year, uh, which is uh, because if you can see here, there is uh, production is fluctuating over over the year. Uh, and experience, experience dramatically die back off. However, if we uh, extend, extend uh, long, longer, uh, this root may approaching the ambient root biomass. Um, according to the soil depth, most of the uh, roots are concentrated in uh, 30 centi uh, centimeters of soil, uh, soil depth. And uh, in order to determine what the factors are controlling uh, below ground production, I made a correlation analysis. And I found out uh, soil temperature significantly uh, uh, affect the total root biomass, but in a negative uh, relationship. Uh, canopy openness uh, uh, and salinity also uh, has uh, contributed to the uh, below ground production as uh, high, highest get uh, shows uh, very uh, less salinity, which is uh, 
For the conclusion, uh, the reproduction greater during and after monsoon season, uh, possibly due to the reduced salinity of seawater, and there are fast growth ro uh, root growth after core setup. Uh, there's also rapid root turnover, and 50% of the roots were concentrated within top 30 centimeters of soil depth. And there is no significant difference between any parameters between the plot. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to reload, have loading again. I'll have to try. I'll have to try, oh, sorry. try the yes oh, tank. Anyway, which is going to be Louise Atherton, who's a postdoc at the Natural History Museum, and we'll be talking about <coughs> global canopy infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. So today I will be talking about a global canopy science review paper that I've been working on. And I just want to start out by pointing out that this is the work of this really big team of people that we've been collaborating together. So today I'm going to talk about why the canopy is important and what, we, what the major advances have been in canopy science and what the major outstanding questions that remain in canopy science are. And then I'll talk about this really exciting expansion of canopy infrastructure. So canopies are the kind of interface between uh, organic nature and the atmosphere. And as you go from the understory to the canopy, a number of different uh, environmental factors shift and you end up with this very complicated matrix of different microhabitats and buffered microclimates. And these can form very stratified and unique communities. And at the very tops of the canopy, there, there may be very unique, different sets of organisms. So the canopy 30 years ago was seen as the last biotic frontier because it's very hard to get up there. And we didn't really know a lot of the diversity that was occurring in the canopy. So access has been traditionally using rope methods and uh, there has been a lot of development over the last 30 years and in, especially in the last decade there's been uh, different kinds of technology that have been incorporated into canopy science to look at understanding the canopy. So today I'm going to talk about how new technology and experimental manipulations can be combined with this new canopy infrastructure to look at uh, addressing those uh, unanswered questions in canopy ecology. So we know that uh, forests are really important and that the, that's being reflected in global environmental policy like with the Paris uh, Climate Summit and things like the New York Declaration to uh, halt forest loss by 2030. But we have so many gaps in our understanding of forests and their canopies in particular at the same time uh, anthropogenic pressure is increasing. So we do need to uh, increase our understanding of forests and their canopies. Uh, and I'll just briefly talk a little bit about what we cover in this review paper and um, what we, what we, uh, I'll, I'll cover a few really uh, key uh, de developments in canopy science. I don't have time to talk about it all. And then we'll talk about what the outstanding questions are. So we talk a lot about forest canopy microclimate and climate and how those shape species diversity distributions and interactions. 
And then we talk extensively about forest and biogeochemical cycling and uh, the anthropogenic impacts on forest canopies. And in particular, we pay a lot of attention to this expanding canopy crane network and incorporating new technologies like LIDAR drones and metabau coding with experimental approaches to address the unanswered questions. So I'm just going to uh, point out a few examples of recent papers that have uh, really advanced the understanding of canopy ecology. So this one uh, by Harris et al. So we know that forest loss leads to a loss of the carbon that is in that forest and also the associated ecosystem services like weather regulation. And this paper by Harris et al. used uh, remote sensing to look at uh, forest loss and they found that between 2000 and 2005, uh, 43 million hectares of forest were removed and at the same time 0.8 gigatons of gar uh, carbon were also produced. Uh, other advances have been made in things like species estimation, so trying to get an understanding of how many species there are in a canopy. Uh, there was a really interesting paper by Stork at our last year and they used museum-based specimen approaches. They came up with four different metrics to try and estimate total diversity of arthropods. And they came up with this figure of seven million species of arthropods globally. Um, however, I would point out that that's based on mainly beetle collections in museums and with species uh, taxonomic groups like m mites and flies especially, especially in the canopy and especially in the tropics, those groups are so poorly described that it's, it is difficult to make extrapolations at the moment. And another really interesting advance in uh, canopy science and understanding the impacts of climate change was this one by Sheffers et al. in 2013 and they used rope access techniques and they climbed uh, trees at different elevations, so using elevation as a space for time approach to understand climate change. And they found that as you go to higher elevations, there's increasing arborality in frogs that are moved to higher, uh, higher heights in the trees. And this is a really interesting result because it shows that species do have some kind of plasticity in where they pick their microhabitats to live. And they predict that with further climate warming uh, in the future, you would have uh, species that move downwards throughout the vertical strata and you may, may see a flattening of biodiversity as, uh, as the temperature increases. This may lead to increased competition at lower heights, increased disease and perhaps extinctions. So what are the unanswered questions in canopy science? So we know that the canopy is a biodiversity hotspot and supports a, a large part of the Earth's biogeochemical processes. We also know that the impacts of the anthropogenic change have shifted from smaller scale to really global scale impacts, but the implications of these shifts for canopy biodiversity, ecosystem function and resilience are not uh, very well understood yet. So I've got a few examples of experimental approaches that are being used to address a lot of these uh, questions that remain in canopy ecology. So we do need to increase our evidence base, especially with looking at experiments to look at how forests respond to things like changing temperature, precipitation, CO2, and what the interactions are between these factors, especially in the tropics. So there's the things like the GEM plots, the Global Ecosystem Monitoring Plot, which is this global network of plots which are looking at how forests uh, and forest traits may respond to climate change. Uh, there's things like the tropical responses to altered climate experiment, which is one in Puerto Rico, and they're heating the soil and the understory and the canopy, and then looking at how the whole forest is responding to increased temperatures. And then there's things like the free air uh, CO2 enrichment experiment, and this one's in Australia. And they've uh, got this really large infrastructure, and what they're doing is increasing the CO2 to what the levels are expected to be in 35 years and looking at how the whole uh, system responds to that increase. So there, there's a lot of opportunities now to incorporate non-experimental data at larger spatial scales so you can incorporate these um, experimental data with larger scale 
um, things like remote sensing and really get more robust uh, approaches to looking at these questions. So in this canopy review paper, we've outlined a number of questions that are really uh, what major outstanding questions in canopy ecology. So things like what are the impacts of anthropogenic <coughs> disturbance on the forest canopy? And in particular, things like gross primary productivity in response to climate change and things like uh, CO2 elevation. How do microclimates buffer the effects of climate change on forest biodiversity? And then there's more fundamental questions like how many species are there in the canopy and what are the mechanisms shaping that diversity? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this expanding uh, canopy infrastructure. And this is some footage I took when I was in China last year. And this is us going up a canopy crane and it's a little bit shaky because I'm actually really afraid of heights, so it was a bit hard. But it's uh, literally um, a construction crane that's been put into the forest and it allows scientists to use these little gondolas to access all strata of the canopy. And it's really useful because you can get to the outside branches that are often really hard to get to. So there's um, a lot of opportunities for really uh, looking at the canopy using this canopy crane approach. And it's um, recently the number of cranes has really expanded. So here is a map of where all the cranes are globally at the moment. We've got two in Australia. One is probably gonna be built in Papua New Guinea next year. They probably will build one at Dannon Valley. Uh, they're, they're still sorting out the funding at the moment, but that does look like it will happen. Um, there's one in Sarawak, one in Hokkaido. There's five new canopy cranes in China over the last few years, and I haven't put the, where they're gonna be located yet because it's not actually clear, but in the next few years, they're gonna build another four. So there'll be a network of nine canopy cranes available in China. There's two in Germany, two in Panama, and there's a different kind of canopy access system now in uh, French Guiana. So one of the major criticisms of ca uh, canopy crane studies have been that often it's just one point in a forest, it's just one canopy crane. It's usually uh, one hectare of forest access. So what we propose in this review paper is to really start incorporating multiple methods so we've got this crane, now we can start um, doing very detailed experimental studies using the crane, but then also make sure that we are incorporating uh, traditional access methods like canopy rope climbing uh, to make spatially replicated points where we do have uh, maybe less uh, highly um, detailed studies, but we do need that spatial replication. And now that we have this network of cranes, we can start having really interesting uh, co comparative studies across these different gradients at different continents in areas with different biogeographical histories. So we have this kind of toolkit to address all of these outstanding questions in canopy ecology. We can incorporate the, cl the crane network as well as climbing, incorporating remote sensing and drones, incorporating things like metabarcoding to look at these ecological questions. And one of the really great things about working on this kind of network of cranes, so I'm, I'm planning a proposal at the moment to work on um, a, a temperate to tropical gradient. And in each of those locations, you can collaborate with the labs that are working there and come up with really powerful comparative analysis. So the canopy is no longer the last biological frontier. We have um, really worked a lot over the last 30 years and we are, do, do have increased our understanding of the canopy. But there's a lot of new avenues with all of this new technology that's becoming increasingly available. <coughs> there's a lot of new avenues that are opening up. The forest canopy does remain under threat from multiple human drivers, um, as does its resilience and resistance to change. And many of the research directions that are talked about are urgent in the face of current rates of forest loss and climate change. And that's it, thank you.
Yes, that's true. So we've, well, the diplocats in, in this site, yes, they, they, would, they would be emergent. And so we might be looking at a more sort of specific group of the diplocats, if you like, rather than um, being able to make a generalization across the family as a whole, whereas in the sort of dry, dry <coughs> north, for example, that they might be quite different, yeah. To strategize to, to get to the top of the canopy. Yeah. Right, yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, our penultimate talking session is my third Sam Temple panel. I hope I pronounced it roughly correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have third and um, humble to introduce him. I think he's just finished his PhD, but he's on there too. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, although we're going to talk a lot about, about trees. Actually, um, the main focus of the talk is, is on, on animals. And it's um, quite important, uh, especially in tropical forests, uh, the idea that many animals are being um, lost inside tropical forests because um, of hunting and on forest fragmentation. And um, this um, process is in the called deformation. And it has also a very important impact on the um, um, Ecosystem, ecosystem services, as I'm going to explain about here in the work. So, um, normally trees, they have different kinds of um, strategies in terms of reproduction, and um, in order to escape predation for, for, for their seeds, which um, are uh, especially vulnerable to attack if they are um, not dispersed away from the mother tree, and also due to um, the seed dependent effects, they have developed them different forms of um, dispersal away from the mother tree. So here you can see, for example, um, an example of uh, predation before dispersal, normally by brooked beetles. And somehow you have, in some cases, they develop by wind, by developing some wing seeds. And in other cases, they have developed attractions to animals, where the animals, they serve as vectors, disperse the, those seeds away. And for example, there's also a very important trade-off in terms of seed size where the number of seeds is related to the number of uh, the weight of the seeds somehow. So you have smaller seeds, you can do more seeds. And if you have larger seeds, you have a better seed survival, but you cannot produce less seeds. And those large seeds can only be dispersed by large um, animals. In this case, here the this friendly tapir. And, but even after the seed are dispersed and they fall in their seed bank, they're also a vulnerable to predation, which, is, which, is a, which I call here predation after dispersal. Red A, and it's normally mediated by, by other animals, uh, such as rodents here. And the population of these rodents are also controlled by larger animals, so that such as um, predators, such as the, the, the jaguar and so on. And yeah, and those all have like a, a cascade of effects, so you have the control of predation of the seed bank, um, directly determined by the, the, the abundance of this um, large um, top food chain um, predator here. So in the case of the fragmented landscapes, then you have um, this sort of scenario where um, we have a very shortened area and very lower resources, and therefore um, larger animals are especially vulnerable in these areas. So you can expect that in these areas, those animals will, will disappear. And in these cases here, for example, for the large seeded, you can expect a, a higher predation before dispersal, and for the, the seeds where they fall, you can expect a higher predation after dispersal because you don't have any more the animals which um, eat um, the seed predators. And in addition to that, have a, a third important effect, which is the, the edge effects, which is an increased mortality around the edges, which is also um, very prominent in fragmented forests. So we want to here understand how does the forest structure as a whole changes um, with, with this, uh, this effect due to, due to the fragmentation by considering not only the edge effects of the high mortality, but also the predation before dispersal and predation after dispersal. So there were other works already done by that, by um, other researchers here, and considering the, the effect of deformation of the forest structure, especially on biomass, which is a, it is a very important um, um, ecosystem services. And this is a very interesting work here by, by Perez and Bello. And, but these, uh, this work was done uh, with the uh, direct uh, removal of trees. But actually what happens is that it's not the trees that are removed, but are the seeds that are removed. 
because they are, they are more attacked and they are more affected in these cases. So um, you, you here we can see that uh, there was a, in this study there was a change of about two to 36 percent of biomass loss to the deformation. And what they did was they removed the larger seeded trees and they substituted it with other um, trees that, that had smaller seeds. And this substitution was to make for the, the opening of the niche. And theref therefore, this uh, change of uh, composition mediated this lower biomass. But here we want to test exactly the removal of the seeds. So in order to do that, we are going to apply a process-based and dynamic simulation model called Formind, which represents the forest as uh, in these individuals of um, the crown, represents it as, as spheres, and uh, the, the tree trunk uh, cylinders. And we take data from the, the field, we apply equations and, of course, uh, computer uh, processing in order to simulate tree growth, mortality, and competition, and, of course, seed processes. This is done every on one, uh, one year um, time um, resolution. And there are, of course, uh, a lot of work done on, on, this, um, on this forest model here already. So the way that Formite deals with the dispersal of the seeds is each, each um, tree here has a dispersal kernel which has a mean and maximum distance of dispersal, and it's the, the seeds are thrown in relation to a distance from the, from the tree point, and each tree has a number of seeds per year that's gonna throw fixed in relation to, the, to, to its species. And those species are grouped in terms of species groups, in functional groups. Commonly in terms of uh, um, the speed of the growth of the tree, or um, the maximum height, and in this case here I defined the seed size. So what I, actually implemented here was the prediction before dispersal, which I simply consider to be a, per a percentage reduction in the number of seeds which each seed produces. So they consider that the, the, the seeds that, that are not dispersed, they are predated by the, uh, the before the dispersal of um, animals. And the prediction before, uh, after dispersal was actually predated by a spatially explicit prediction equation in which each of those plots here doing the simulation area of four mine um, has a different mortality in relation of the number of mother trees, which increases the, the number of predators and increases the mortality because the mother trees, they attract the predators. And the number of seeds, which the, the seed produces, actually can satiate the predators and therefore um, promote lower predation rates that they experience. Therefore, it's more or less um, escape of predation and the search for an ideal um, safe site for, for establishment. So the place where we use and then to do the simulation is this area here um, in the Northeast Brazil. It's an area um, with a fragmented forest, has a long-term long studies and done with different biological groups. And um, this area is interesting because it has also data on the seed um, rain for each of the tree species in the area. So we grouped all this data from, the, from this area in Serra Grande, Brazil into six different plant functional types in relation to the shade tolerance and the dis seed dispersal from small seeds and large seeds. And you can see here the data of the seeds that dispersed per year. So it's more or less four, four million seeds um, as a whole. And it's important to note how the large seeds, they produce in general a, a, a less number than the, the smaller seeds. So they have a less chance of satiating the predators as a whole. So what we're going to do here, the scenario is we're going to reduce the percentage of the seeds per year for the large seeds, the dispersal loss, and we're going to um, increase the predation after dispersal for the whole group since it's more or less generalized here in our, in our simulations. So we can expect from the field data that, that have been done some studies that about from 60 to 97 percent has been reported in um, heavily hunted areas, so we can expect this range of values, more or less, for the reduction of the, for the dispersal, uh, reduction in uh, predation of uh, large cities. So here are start the simulations. So here's the typical um, graph of the simulation of farm mine. So here in the beginning, you have a mature forest plot from the Serra Grande area, and it's heavily dominated here in the community by um, shade tolerant trees. And please note here, this red one is one of the large um, shade tolerant large seeded trees. And at the uh, year 50, we activate it for a here in, in this example here, 95% reduction in, in the dispersal before, uh, the prediction before dispersal. So here, after some time, the community changes 
and we have a domination by pioneer trees. So what we can also see that's interesting is that this um, plant functional type of small seed here, which was um, absolutely not, not changed, was also affected, of course, by the, the, the changes in the species composition and so on, and the complement was completely changed over 700 years. So, but we tested only 95%. So let's try some different variations here. So this is the, the, the simulation that I showed to you right now. And we are gonna t test now different percentages. The, each, each percentage here is a simulation of around 700 years. So we're gonna vary here the, the, the prediction. So for a low uh, prediction after dispersal, which is the black line here that we shown already, the, the, the prediction can increase um, significantly before it collapses and the community shifts and you can expect around 20% uh, biomass. And even if we increase the predation density <coughs> more and more a little bit, the, the number of seeds which uh, th this community can um, buffer in terms of changes in the seed dispersal is still high. But if the predation after dispersal is increased uh, to a very, very high density, then you can expect the community shift to already, without considering dispersal before predation, to be shifted. So now we're gonna add to the, to the prediction before, prediction after dispersal, also edge effect. So here in the simulation, we included here around 100 meters from the edge of the simulation area, the double of, of the mortality, and you can see here the blue, which is the large seeded PFTs, the plant functional types, and the yellow and the red. And you can see that here is the areas which are not, not affected by edge effects. And these areas have a, a higher mortality rate, so it's shifted anyway for a small seeded PFT <coughs> seeds area. So this is the black line here um, for, for different fragment sizes. So the larger the fragment, the less area is affected by the edge effect, which is fixed at around 100 meters. So without predation, you can see that we can uh, really niche the, the field data for our undisturbed forest around 121 um, hectares of size. And it would re re uh, as we make a, a larger area, it will generally um, increase and reach the field data after a, a certain size. But if we increase the predation of before dispersal, about 95% here, then the community shifts completely, even for very, very large fragments. And the same case for the predation after dispersal, even without considering the, the predation before dispersal. So what we have found here is the importance of, of several simulations to test the effect of the foundation and so on by considering directly the loss of seeds and of course the, the loss of animals and that this increased seed predation can lead to a loss of about 20% of forest biomass. So between the, the 2% and 36 that we've seen before other studies, we can pinpoint exactly a number for the services that uh, those large animals provide in terms of biomass and could connect directly the loss of an animal to the, um, to the loss of the, the tree service here. And that the increased seed predation can also lead to shifts in in uh, sp species composition, the loss of some from vulnerable green species. And that also we, we, we can see that the, those fragmented forests, they can be additionally um, impacted by the um, deformation and due to seed predation as a whole. So thank you very much. <laughs> You mean the uh, after or, this or before the dispersal? Uh, you how mean? are you actually modeling the seed predator community, or are you trying to incorporate? Well, the seed predator community, I'm, I am I uh, am modeling in terms of simple consumption of seeds. Mm -hmm. So the seeds are treated as a resource, yep. and I use the Hollings diff, diff equation in, in order to consider the the seeds as a resource or as a a, 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 a resource that the predators will, will eat individually. Mm -hmm. So. The number of, of, of the seeds um, is eaten by the number of the predators. So at a certain point, if the seeds are, are too much, then the, the predator is satiated and then they will not be able to eat anymore. So the, the seeds uh, essentially escape predation in, in this sense by larger numbers. 
So what I did also is uh, change the, 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 this density to see the sensibility of this um, seed number that is produced for each of the plot in this first, yeah. and to see what, what happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a very simple kind of model. It's, hard, it's a problem that you have to do for you then, that you've got under-simulated the animal communities and they simulate the trees. Yeah, yeah, but of course, um, I am very interested in simulating also the animal yeah. community. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, I just like yeah. <laughs> and I want to do that, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Yes, definitely, def especially in terms of um, the abundance of this, um, this vulnerable species group, but also of other species group which were in certain ways vulnerable to the rise of other species group which are um, uh, facilitated by the loss of this um, group which was dominating before. So for example, there's this small seeded shade tolerant group that when the, the larger seeded um, um, uh, species group is lost, then it also loses dominance because it, there are another species group comes and takes it, its um, its place over there. So it's not very so so much trivial to reduce one and substitute the the tree species. So it's like a, a cascading effect internally inside the community. Thank you, Matthias. Yeah. Well, thanks for staying to the very end, everyone. And we're going to the talk circle because we're back to um, David Coombs' group at Cambridge. And yeah, actually there are none because uh, David forbid me to uh, include any uh, with very good criteria actually because it was horrible when it was including the, the, uh, uh, the equations. Uh, so, uh, and I'm also a LIDAR researcher, but uh, today I'm not talking to you anything about LIDAR. I will talk to you about uh, uh, indicators of uh, uh, tree inequality, tree size inequality, sorry. And, uh, and the reason why I, I pay attention on tree size inequality is uh, because it's an important component of forest structure. So what we want to do is uh, discriminate whether we are in this type of forest that uh, all the trees are more or less of the same size or uh, we are in this other type of uh, forest where we can find many uh, different tree size classes uh, in it. Uh, so uh, they can have uh, different types of uh, diameter distributions. Uh, so there are plethora of uh, indicators that uh, authors have been using to, to describe this uh, tree size inequality. Uh, and because this situation looks more entropic than this, uh, Probably the vast majority of them were uh, actually based on the on the concept of uh, entropy theory of uh, information. Uh, vast majority using a Shannon index, so uh, you all know all these indices. So it's basically uh, adapting uh, instead of studying species diversity, we study the diversity of uh, tree size classes. So we basically are apportioning the. Uh, uh, the uh, size uh, variable we use in into size classes. Uh, and then the other group uh, uh, of uh, all the indicators that are found, uh, are found them uh, based uh, ultimately on uh, Lorentz ordering. So uh, in the end of uh, my research, uh, what uh, the conclusion that I got was basically that doing the, using the first group, doing this is conceptually wrong. And we should do this instead so I'll try to make a point of uh, why I reached that con conclusion and uh, uh, make it understandable for you. So uh, I won't explain much about entropy. Uh, you uh, had a, we had a beautiful uh, keynote uh, this morning uh, that uh, told us about the uh, uh, generalized uh, entropy and uh, we can see the Hills numbers uh, in a whole profile, so we see them uh, all at the same time and we see whether they are uh, consistent or they are redundant. Um, we have uh, dominance here, we have uh, richness here and all the degrees in between. And then we got the other concept that is the concept of the Lorentz curve, which is uh, maybe uh, less familiar for most of you. So it was uh, developed a century ago, uh, widely used in, the, in uh, econometrics uh, to measure uh, inequality of uh, income, inequality of uh, wealth between the, the individuals in a society. 
So this method uh, is essentially adapting it uh, to four exercises. So we answering, we're trying to answer questions uh, such as uh, is 20% uh, of the trees in that forest uh, having 80% uh, of the total biomass, uh, kind of Pareto principle that is used uh, in that uh, other field. So what I found the results uh, was um, that uh, when using this uh, Shannon diversity, uh, it really didn't make sense to me. Uh, uh, when observing those uh, different forest structural types, it, it really doesn't wow. doesn't look like uh, 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 ranking uh, forest forest structural types in a, in a logical manner. Uh, if we use uh, even this counterpart of those uh, indices, of course, I've had lots of results for all kinds of indicators, but uh, this is the generality that I saw, was that we may be able with evenness to, to differentiate uh, rough groups of uh, coarse groups of uh, forest structural types, but uh, still uh, uh, using these other indices, we really had a, a much better, uh, much logical ranking for the forests uh, that we were uh, looking for. So then I was wondering uh, what was exactly going on. Uh, and like I was saying, the uh, vast majority of people using uh, Sanon, I, I really thought that I need to find uh, a strong, uh, a strong um, arguments uh, against it if I want to say anything against. So then uh, I had a, a deeper look in, uh, into the definition of diversity. What are we actually doing when we, we use uh, a diversity index? Uh, so then I found this. Uh, uh, basically, uh, if we want to move, uh, if we, we want to have this, uh, this uh, forest situation uh, and have it into a, a more diverse one, we should do uh, either of these three steps. One would be introducing a new size class. We will have something more diverse. Also can be if we uh, transfer abundances in such a way that they become uh, more, uh, more equal. So uh, we will have a higher diversity in this. And there is another rule that if we just permute the uh, elements of the abundance vector, the index will give exactly the same number. So uh, how we prove this uh, is called intrinsic diversity ordering. And there are many ways of, uh, of testing, it, uh, testing this, uh, but I chose one that is majorization, which is basically that we rank uh, the abundance vector uh, and we uh, accumulate it. So this gives us a, a scale of increasing diversity, uh, and then we can compare our populations uh, and see if, uh, if, those, if the lines of uh, each population, of those populations don't cross, then we can use a diversity index to compare them. But if they are crossing, we are not really complying with that, and we cannot use a, an index anymore. This uh, doesn't make sense anymore. So, uh, this was exactly what was happening. If we see uh, the results uh, for uh, all the plots that we were using, what we see in there is, is nothing. It's, uh, it's just a mess. Uh, we cannot see anything. So, so uh, it's just showing that this doesn't make sense. Uh, if we do uh, the same for uh, equitability, that, uh, so basically we are also uh, accumulating in the X uh, axis, uh, and that would correspond to evenness uh, indices, then it, it seems to make more sense when we don't uh, weight it uh, by biomass or any such thing, uh, any, any property. Uh, so that was why evenness indexes were actually making more sense. Uh, so uh, this is the first conclusion. Uh, we, we shouldn't be using an uh, index of diversity, we should be using an index of uh, um, evenness instead. But then I'll continue developing the, the math uh, further and, and you need to check the, um, the um, publication uh, because I didn't uh, include any formulas, but this is the concept. Uh, uh, why instead of uh, uh, using uh, size classes, uh, we just do it uh, by individuals. Yeah. So, so this is exactly then we got the Lorentz curve and then we see that uh, there is a much more logical ranking for all those uh, forest classes. So, uh, so uh, this is it. Uh, it simply doesn't make sense to use uh, uh, diversity. It makes sense to use Lorentz ordering. Then the amplitude of that curve gives the Gini coefficient, 
and uh, that is the index that we should in principle uh, be using. Uh, well, there has been many things that uh, have been uh, going further with, but uh, actually uh, following that same logic uh, uh, for the studies that I was doing, uh, I, even, uh, I was able to, uh, differ, uh, to calculate what is exactly the Gini coefficient value that should correspond to maximum entropy. And we can do this for uh, other, for other uh, types of, of other, other variables it can be a different uh, number. But, uh, but uh, what I argue is that actually Lorentz ordering, we can use it as a scale of dispersion and a scale of entropy at the same time. That, uh, that uh, actually um, we just need to uh, calculate uh, where maximum entropy would be and we are still using Lorentz ordering for both things at the same time, if entropy is what we are interested in anyway. So, uh, I would need a, a presentation, uh, a whole other presentation to, to tell you about this, but of course we have been using all this uh, uh, to study uh, the drivers of change in forest structure and, and, and so on. Uh, we have been using uh, for, uh, further uh, indicators, this Lorenz asymmetry was, uh, uh, Christian Dangar is not here, but uh, he's around now. Uh, we have been using it quite a lot, uh, uh, but the main conclusion of this, uh, of this uh, presentation is basically that we should move from speaking about the structural diversity, which is uh, very commonly used a term like this, uh, to three, si three size inequality, and it's not a semantic question, it's a conceptual question, actually. So, um, I think this is it. Uh, yeah, uh, I presented uh, this work in a, in a thesis last year, so you can search for it. Uh, if you're interested uh, further, and also that publication that I showed you. Um, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, comments, or criticism, it's very welcome. So um, what we're trying to, uh, what we're measuring here when we're using the Lorentz curve is actually dominance. Like I was saying, as it's 20% uh, of the trees uh, having 80% of the uh, uh, of, of the biomass. Actually, what is it? Is yeah, it would be somewhere like in there. Is it that much? So. My core hypothesis is actually that with LIDAR, uh, we're not really uh, measuring uh, diameter distribution, but we're measuring dominance. So, indeed, I got a point on that too, yeah. Okay, and that, I assume in this you're mostly talking about single species plants. Exactly, exactly. I, I'm not yeah. uh, mixing up, let's say, yet. When you've got multiple species, say, in the generating We got, to, we got to think about it. I mean, uh, I think that if we mix species in the end, we should just go for richness. So the problem, the problem is, is mainly in, in using Shannon. I mean, this, uh, how I found about all this? Well, this uh, has been a really big discussion in, in ecology, maybe in the 60s, 70s, uh, maybe it went far to the, to the 80s. Uh, People were saying, don't just use one index. You, you need to, this is an assumption of the method. You, you need to test it and, and then you can use a, an index. And I would say that that's probably why richness uh, has been finally the more used than Shannon uh, because it doesn't give this problem. Uh, uh, so, um, so I would go for richness, but uh, in the end, uh, I think that richness, even though I put it, uh, here in the beginning, I put it in this group. I think it could well uh, be uh, in this group. If you think that is uh, in the end uh, like uh, uh, a variability for a, uh, 
הפירות כזה ועוד. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> Good one.